Hi, and welcome to the Peak Endurance Podcast. My name is Isabel Ross, and I'm the coach at Peak Endurance Coaching. Episode 66 is an interview with Alex Hutchinson, the author of the book Endure, Mind, Body, and the Curiously Elastic Limits of Human Performance. In Endure, Alex Hutchinson, PhD, reveals why our individual limits may be determined as much by our head and heart as by our actual muscles. He presents an overview of science's search for understanding human fatigue, from crude experiments with electricity and frog's legs to sophisticated brain imaging technology. Going beyond the traditional mechanical view of human limits, he instead argues that a key element in endurance is how the brain responds to distress signals, whether from heat or cold or muscles screaming with lactic acid, and reveals that we can train to improve brain performance. Excuse the dog in the background. (laughs) Do you have injuries or niggles ruining your enjoyment of running and hindering your performance? Running is a great way to focus on yourself and your health, and it's so important to be able to keep doing what you love. Come in and see the specialists at Health, (coughs) pardon me, and High Performance, where they utilise the latest in technology and experience to help you achieve the results you want and are capable of. So head to healthhp.com.au forward slash run or find them on Instagram, health high performance. Thank you so much for supporting the podcast. Rating, reviewing and sharing helps more people find the podcast. In next week's episode, I chat with Rob Preston, member of the East Gippsland team that came third in the Eco Challenge as seen on Prime. Uh, This week, I also speak to Richard Zeri, who's a race director. In these times, it's more important than ever to have a structured plan to ensure you maximise your training. The benefit of online training is it doesn't matter what state or country you are in, I can help you reach your athletic peak. Staying committed to your training at the moment is the one thing that you can have control over. If you need an individualised plan, email me, isabel, at peakendurancecoaching.com.au to chat about a training plan. Have a great week of training and stay safe and well. Enjoy the interview with Alex. Hi, Alex, and welcome to the Peak Endurance Podcast. Thanks, Isabel. I appreciate the invitation. Can you um, tell the listeners a bit about yourself and your running background? Sure. I mean, I'm a I'm a, currently a middle aged runner uh, who trains hard and races relatively infrequently, but my background is as a, as a track runner. Um, I ran, let's say national level in Canada for, for a number of years. I, I competed at the world cross country championships a few times and I ran 1500 meters in 342, which is right around a, f- a four minute mile. So uh, not at the international level, but at the, I, I competed very seriously at the national level, trying to make it to the international level um, for, for, a lot of years, which is really the the foundation of uh, my interests in endurance and my personal experiences in, in understanding what it means to push limits, and uh, so that's my that's the running side. And and uh, my job is as a journalist. I'm a uh, but as more specifically a science journalist, and more specifically than that, I guess I would call myself an, an endurance science journalist because most of what I spend my days doing is writing about uh, the science of endurance. Yeah, now I've got the book um, Endure, Mind, Body and the Curiously Elastic Limits of Human Performance. What um, prompted your interest in wanting to write that book? Yeah, I mean, it really was born out of my own experiences as a runner. I mean, um, when I was competing, and I was competing mostly in the 1990s and early 2000s for my most serious time of competing, um, if you'd asked me, what do, you know? What do, what's the difference between a good race and a bad race? Or how? What do, what defines your limits? What what separates you from the Olympians? Say, I would have talked about VO2 max and lactate threshold and uh, muscle, you know, fast twitch and slow twitch muscles and, thing, and things like that. But when when you sort of start to examine that and think about what differentiates your good race from your bad races, you realize you know, I can go and push as hard as I can in a workout and run in one time and then I can go uh, in a race and all of a sudden I, I achieve something that, that feels not necessarily any different, but is you're able to push harder or, or some days you have a better race than other days. There's just, to me, there's, there's an X factor that, that means that uh, competition is never just 
what you're capable of, what your limits are is never just a function of like, oh, well, I ran this in workout and therefore I should be able to run that in a race. And so there's that unknown factor always sort of, I was curious about it. And when I became a, a, when I started out as a freelance journalist, which was actually a sort of second career for me, I started out as a physicist. But when I switched to journalism in my late 20s and I started wanting to write about things I was interested in, such as running, and I started to look into, oh, I thought it would be fun to sort of talk to some of the scientists who study running and, and try and understand what really does define our limits. And, and what I found is that the, the answer at that time, which is about 10 or 15 years ago, was we don't know. You know, we, there were a lot of debates about what, what is, it? is it? At what point does your brain hold you back versus your body? And, and, and stumbling on an area of really open inquiry in science was really interesting to me. And so that became something that I wanted to write about more and more. And then over the course of about a decade, I, end, I ended up uh, covering the sort of the mysteries of, of the science of endurance. And eventually I sort of realized hey, this should be, a, I'm going to turn this into a book. I think that there's enough here to, to, to support more than just a, you know, a long article. Yeah, no, definitely. I would agree. So what is endurance? <laughs> if you have to know, or if you have to ask, you'll never know, right? Yeah, that's um, it. <laughs> uh, you know, there's the, the, one of the definitions I used in the book was it's the struggle to continue against a mounting desire to stop, which I was sort of cheating a little bit because that's actually the definition one of the science, researchers I've spoken to uses for the, the perception of effort. If you say, how hard, you know, how hard are you working on a scale of one to 10? And, and if you say, well, what do you mean? How hard am I working? Like, we're not talking about pain. We're talking about the struggle to continue against a mounting desire to mm. stop. And that's really, to me, what endurance is. And, and it, it's not just about, you know, trying to run a 10K. We have all these metaphorical uses for the word endurance, um, you, know, it, you know, putting up with annoying people or, or you know, yeah. sitting in an uncomfortable seat on a, on, a, on a plane ride or something, which everyone in Australia is obviously okay. familiar with since everywhere you go, it takes 20 hours. Um, exactly. Th these are metaphorical uses of endurance, but they also require a struggle to continue against a mounting desire to stop. And one of the sort of interesting things to me is that there isn't necessarily a, a really clear, easy distinction between endurance in a race and endurance in these other contexts that really, in all those cases, are, it, it, the, the fundamental struggle is in your head. Uh, and, and so we're, we're all sort of pushing back against limits that are to some extent self-imposed. Yeah, yep. No, I, I just really like that definition that, that you have put in the book. So that's, yeah, why I did ask as well. So um, you go in the book through different um, uh, parts of endurance and, and you talk about the central governor. And um, what is the role in, of the central governor in limiting our ability to endure and can we manipulate this? Sure. Yeah. So I guess the, the simplest way to describe this idea of a central governor is that it's uh, the, the point at which your brain is holding you back. You're, you're pushing as hard as you can. And it's not that your legs are incapable of moving anymore, or that your heart is incapable of beating any faster. It's that your brain thinks you shouldn't push any harder. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a sort of, you can divide physiology into, into sort of epochs where for most of the 20th century, scientists were trying to figure out what are our limits in a sort of mechanical plumbing sense how much oxygen can you your heart pump to your muscles um, and these sorts of things and it, with this idea that we're just like a car if you can figure out the size of the engine and the size of the gas tank you can calculate how what this car is capable of doing and it was in the 1990s that a guy named tim noakes in south africa started talking about this idea of a central governor saying that actually you know when you run a race you're not can, like people sprint at the end of races and mm. then they keep jogging. They don't die. They don't cross the finish line and then die. We're not at our absolute limits where we're using everything up. So there must be a brain that is, or, or a function of the brain that is uh, acting for your self-preservation in, in a way that, you know, thousands of years ago on the Savannah was making sure you didn't just keep chasing the antelope until you've keeled over and then died. You, you, you was like, there was a point where he said, all right, this is as far as hard as I can go. And I'm going to turn around and make it back to the campfire. So, sorry, that's a long, long answer to say, that's the idea of a central governor. And nobody can put you in a brain scanner and say, oh, here's your central governor. <laughs> um, so it's, it's more of a concept than a, than a thing. And there's lots of debate and active debate about how the brain actually plays a role 
in your limits. So lots of people would say there's no such thing as central governor, but I think most people now agree that your brain, brain plays a role and the sort of master switch is your perception of effort, that as you push harder and harder, or you know, push in a race, your, your subjective perception of how hard your working goes up. And that subjective perception of effort is being informed by what's going on in your body, how hard you're breathing, how hard your heart is pounding, but also how you're feeling, what's going on in your head, whether you're optimistic or pessimistic, whether you're tired or stressed. And put it together, that, that sense of effort will determine at any given moment whether you feel you can go faster or whether you have to slow down. So when we talk about how can you sort of change the settings of the central governor, I mean, the... The, the most powerful way is to train. Yeah. If, if, you, if you make your body fitter, then running at a given pace will feel easier. And so you'll be able to um, uh, sustain that effort for longer because it feels easier, which is just another way of, of talking about what physical training does for you. But what's sort of interesting and maybe different and what sort of a, maybe a newer area is, well, other ways we can alter your perception of effort or you know, tune the, the settings on the central governor totally independent of what's going on in your muscles. So independent of whether you're actually getting fitter, can you make exercise feel easier and allow you to uh, push harder? And, and the answer is yes. And there are some well-known ways of doing that. Caffeine is, is a pretty good example of something whose yeah. primary effect is probably changing your perception of effort. It doesn't make you stronger. It doesn't give you more fuel or change anything about your muscles. It just makes what you're doing feel easier. And there's some other ways that people have experimented with, like electric brain stimulation, which is still very early going. The evidence is very mixed, but there's some evidence you can, if by applying electricity basically to the regions of the brain that uh, are involved in, in formulating your perception of effort, you can change that perception of effort, make it feel easier and push harder. But I think the more, that, the, the more interesting ones to me are ways are, are, are sort of go, go into sports psychology, which is an area I'm not an, an, an expert in, but, but where um, there, there's some very interesting evidence that the, the thoughts you have in your head and the mindset and the monologue that you're, the words that you're telling yourself in the, over the course of a race, they have a real impact on this perception of effort. That if you're telling yourself, oh, this is so hard, there's no way I can keep up with that, that guy over there. And this is, so, why do I do this stupid sport in the first place? Okay. But that is, going to influence your, your perception of effort. It's going to be higher than it would otherwise be. And that's going to convince you that you need to slow down a bit, as opposed to if you can make changes using techniques like motivational self-talk. So that what you're telling yourself is that, you know, when the, when the going gets tough, you're telling yourself, this is what I've trained for. I can do this. All right. This is going to be, you know, I, I can keep going. And to me, that stuff I find challenging because I'm a very sort of empirical pragmatist. I want to see things you can measure and uh, and really know, see how they're working. And so to, to say, well, you don't need to think happier thoughts. I find that challenging, but I also find the evidence that it works to be really intriguing. Yeah. And, and, um, I, I like that in, in the book about that, but, um, so if we're doing that self-talk and, and like you so, say, if you're more pragmatic, if you don't, if you're saying it, but you don't fully believe it, does it still have the same effect? <sighs> Not the same effect. Does it have some effect? Probably. Yeah. And I think that's, what, that's why it's so hard to give a, 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 a sort of three-step recipe for motivational self-talk because what works for one person is definitely not going to work for another person. And some people may really thrive with, uh, you know, r what seem like very cheesy motivational lines to other people. Well, and, and for other people, for, for people like me, to be frank, you need to think very carefully about something that is positive, but that you can actually believe. That's why the, the example I often give is like, I've trained for this. Cause that's true. I have yeah. trained for this. Like, yeah. It doesn't mean I'm going to be able to, you know, I can't say, you know, I have wings and I'm going to fly now or whatever. <laughs> Cause I don't believe that, but, but I do believe that I've trained for it. And that is a positive message that can re reinforce. And, and if you, if you look at the sort of interventions they use in some of these studies, it's never like you're going to start off, doing a test and then we're going to teach you three things to say and then you're going to say those things and you're going to get better what it is is we're going to start we're going to do tests you're going to keep track of the things you say you're going to make note of the things you say when you're pushing hard you're going to identify the ones that are problematic that are negative that are self-defeating and we're going to come up with replacements and you're going to you're, you yourself are going to come up with a list of 20 possible things you could say then we're going to put you on the bike or on the treadmill and you're going to try them 
And the ones that make you blush when you're saying them, you're not going to try those again. You're, the ones that, so it's not a question of testing which ones work because you, you can't, it's very, that's a very subtle thing to, to, to tease out. But the first step is to find which ones you can say to yourself with a straight face. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, I think my list is much shorter than, than many people's because again, it, it has to be something that I, that I believe is true. And, you know, we, we can talk about like it, obviously the concept of self-belief is a very complicated one, but um, you know, and, and the more self-belief you have, the better in a lot of ways, but you can't fake it. You can't, that's why, I mean, and, and you know, it, it, the related question of, you know, how do you enhance your self-belief? And I, I, I think of like Kenyan running success. Why w of the 50 reasons Kenyans are so good to me, one of them is like every runner I've spoken to from Kenya is like, yeah, my cousin, you know, was third at the Olympics 10 years ago or whatever. And I have four friends from my village who are professional runners. So there's this sense that they know, they know that people like them have had great success in running. So to them, it's not such a leap to say, sure, I can run a 61 minute half marathon. I mean, man, th th that would make me the 11th fastest person from my village or whatever. Uh, so there's a sense of belief. And then once you do something, you know, whatever you do, you, can, you know, you can do that plus a little more because no one ever finishes a race and says, that's the fastest I can ever run. Everyone always thinks, oh man, if only I hadn't lost concentration in the, the case. So there's, there's ways of building belief that don't just rely on sort of waving your magic wand. Yeah. And what about the role of visualization? Yeah, I think that's, it's, it's another great example of something that sports psychologists have been talking about since the mm. uh, you know, 1970s and that people like me, so when I was in the, in the 1990s uh, in, in university, we had a, a sports psychologist working with our track team and we, we really just didn't take it seriously because we didn't, you know, it, it didn't fit with our mindsets and we, we didn't have, we weren't presented with evidence that it works. It sounded like just some ideas that someone came up with, but I think there's no doubt that, that visualization works. And I think there's a number of different ways that visualization works. One is, you know, enhancing self-belief and, and, and uh, sort of helping yourself be confident in your goals. But I think there's also roles for being prepared for any situation, being prepared for what will inevitably be, you know, for, at least for in most cases, you're going to be uncomfortable. There's going to be things that go wrong. You're going to face that moment where your plan is going awry. And if you've been through that situation before, if you, in your head, if you've rehearsed, what's it going to feel like when I've, after six months of training, I get to the halfway mark and I realize that I'm 30 seconds behind my goal or whatever. You're more, if, if you don't have to invent a response to that, if you can feel it. So not just, not just rehearsing what it's like to win but, or to, to achieve your goals, but it, to, uh, rehearsing what it's like to uh, rebound or change, change courses or be resilient in the face of adversity. I, th I think that really helps in, uh, in, because uncertainty is, I think, one of the great, um, one of the great challenges. So, if you look at one of the areas of research that I find interesting is when when people, when basically researchers trick their subjects. So they do things like uh, tell them they're going to run 10k and have them actually run 15k or whatever, or change, make the clocks run fast or slow, do things to mess with your expectations. And w one of the things that's hardest for people they find is if you just say, "Okay, go out and run." at this pace and I'll tell you when to stop, but you have no idea when you're going to stop. If you don't know, if you have uncertainty, if you don't, we, we really thrive on knowing what the end point is and working towards that end point. So I think in a related point with visualization, if you're, you're reducing the level of uncertainty, if you've gone through, if you've visualized the course, if you've visualized what's going to happen. So at every given point on the course, when you're in, in an actual race, there's less feeling of uncertainty and more feeling of, uh, and as a, as a result, more feeling of control that you're doing what you, something you're 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 ready to do yeah i mean i've also heard people say oh, i don't want to um focus on negative things that might happen but like you say it's it's having that control and being able to respond in the moment i guess yeah and i think one thing that's really important to to emphasize is that people are different right like everyone has a different collection of strengths and weaknesses and and maybe needs a different uh you know, will benefit from, from different things. There, there may be some people who are, you know, by inclination, pessimistic and, uh, you know, always tend to think of the worst case scenarios and maybe what they need to focus on is visualizing success and what that feels like. And, and there may be other people who are just sort of happy go lucky, 
and they need to be maybe they need to visualize some of the possible challenges they're going to face just so they're not knocked you know the first time something goes wrong there's something like oh wait i've been imagining that it was all going to be easy so and it's similarly like uh you know i one of the things i read about in the book or I, at least i mentioned briefly in the book is research related to like facial expression and the the, the idea that when you're smiling that sends a signal a subconscious signal that your effort is a little bit easier and there is a little bit of evidence that um you know if you're smiling you'll rate a given level of a given pace of running to be slightly easier than if you're frowning and so that's a that's kind of a catchy finding and people find that really well it's it's easy it's it's something that's easy to do it's not like go run 100 miles a week it's like oh just smile and everything will feel easier that's wonderful but then i, I when, when, you know, sometimes when I'm in talks, I, I present that idea and then someone will stick up their hand and say, I've always found completely the opposite. To, to run my best, I need to be angry and I need to be scowling. And it's like, that, I, that may well be true. Everyone is, everyone's different. And so it's, it's, it's not so much a question of like, here are the three things you need to do to be successful. It's understanding that what's going on in your mind can actually affect what you feel to be your physical limits. And in a sense, everyone has to do their own experimentation to figure out what works best for them and, and whether that's positive or negative visualization or smiling or frowning or, or, uh, or, or whatever the case may be. But yeah, I, I think there's, there are very few universals and I think that's one of the things that makes it so hard to study is that yeah. it's, like, it's like if you were testing eyeglasses, you can't just take one prescription and give it to everyone and, and, uh, in the population and say, let's see if it makes people see better. And on average, it's like, no, it doesn't help. That doesn't mean glasses don't help. It just means that you can't give the same prescription to everyone. In regards to the smile, can you fake a smile and that still has some effect? <laughs> well, this is, I mean, again, this is super controversial science. Some of the original studies back in the 80s, they used a pencil. So you'd, you'd either Hi. be grabbing a pencil between your teeth, uh, which I guess I'm on a podcast. I shouldn't be trying to demonstrate sh shoving my finger in my That's mouth. That's right. Anyway, I have the, the you, video recording too. <laughs> okay. Okay. I should have shaved after all. Okay. <laughs> but uh, um, y yeah, if you put a pencil in your teeth lengthways, so you're holding it like a, like a, between your teeth, that activates frowning muscles. If you put it in oh, okay. uh, crossways, like a, a dog with a bone, it activates some smiling muscles. And so you can do that manipulation where people have no idea they're not smiling they're not frowning. They just happen to be activating some of the same muscles. And that in some versions of the experiment, at least does activate the, this sort of perception the, the way they, the way they tested it is they showed them far side cartoons and they found them funnier when they were holding the, the, the pencil uh. in a way that, that uh, produced a smile. So in that sense, I think there is a bit of uh, you know, fake it till you make it that you, you don't have to, you know, you start with the action, you put, put the smile on your face and it doesn't have to be a genuine smile. Um, now there's a point at which if you're just sort of gluing this uncomfortable smile on your face, you're probably going to be spending more effort trying to hold your face in an artificial smile than the benefit you're going to get out of it. So you, you, I think you want to kind of try and feel it and sort of not just, turn the corners of your mouth up, but say, Hey, I'm choosing to be out here. This is great. You know, I, I could be, uh, you know, I could be locked down in my room and instead I'm out here running. So, <laughs> so true. life is pretty good and I should appreciate this and, and try and actually feel good as opposed to just, just grinning. Yep. Yep. No, that's completely fair enough. Um, <clears throat> now there was also some studies done where they, um, showed, you know, the, the participants were watching video and they were showing smiling faces that they couldn't see. How can we use that sort of concept to help us, um, and, and that improve their performance? How can we use that concept to help us perform? Yeah, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to close my window because it's hailing outside. Oh, okay, so fair enough. I, I don't want you to hear like. There we go. Just in case the hail is getting loud. Yeah. yeah. yeah so this is this is a, a really interesting thing. That this is one of my favorite studies where they showed these sort of uh, smiling or frowning faces just flashing on the, on the on a screen in front of people for 16 milliseconds at a time. So you can't, you totally can't perceive it. It's like a tenth the length of a blink, but it still had an effect on how people perform. Now, I think as tempting as it is, as it is I don't think there's like direct takeaways where it's like, okay, so you invest in the subliminal you know, <laughs> brainwashing machine and, uh, you know, flash it in front of, you know, frowning faces in front of your, in front of your enemies or, or, or whatever. <laughs> I think it's, to me, it's, it's more of a reminder of the ways in which your environment can influence you, the, the ways in which the people around you and, your, and also your physical environment might be putting you in a, in, a, in a mindset or in a frame of mind where you're ready to push harder or 
might be putting you in a mindset where you want to quit. Uh, so whether it's, uh, you know, a face, a smiling face flashing on a wall for 16 milliseconds, or whether it's the interaction you have with a friend or family member or coach who either as you're on your way out the door for your workout or your race makes you feel like you can do it or brings you down a little bit. And, and, you know, sometimes what, you know, when I'm, when I'm speaking to coaches, I remind them, like, just remember that beyond the words you say that the way you interact with people is going it, to, it, I mean, it's not like it's going to, you know, make people 50% faster, or 50% slower, but you, you, you know, there's all these subtle interactions we have that are putting people, pushing people a little more towards believing they can push harder or pushing people a little more towards feeling defeated before they even start. And so I think being aware of your environment is, you know, as an athlete, as, as if, you, if you're racing yourself, being aware of the space you put yourself in and the people you interact with before a race is maybe something to take away from that. Yep. No, very important. Um, now you also um, in the book talked about the role of mentally fatiguing tasks before um, working out. And also you yourself tried um, to, you did that as part of your training. Can you talk a little bit about that as well? Yeah, this is another great example where the, of where there's fascinating research where I think the takeaway is a little bit oblique. So what I did is something called brain endurance training. And, and the idea here is that, so first of all, there's some good research showing that if you do something mentally fatiguing, something that requires a lot of sustained focus, and then you immediately try and do a physical exercise, you're going to have worse physical performance. So you're going to, going back to this idea of perception of effort as the central dial that controls your endurance. If you do something, and in, in the studies, what they do is, you know, you sit in front of a computer, shapes are flashing on the screen and you're pressing buttons in response to the shapes. You do that for 90 minutes. Then the moment you then move over onto the exercise bike and start pedaling and, they, and the researchers ask you, well, what's your effort on a scale of one to 10? It's immediately higher, even though you're not physically tired yet. You're your perception of how hard it is altered by mental fatigue. So one of the sort of interesting uh, ideas that comes out of this is, well, maybe we can train that because, you know, let's say running a marathon, that is mentally fatiguing. Even if you start fresh, by the time you're at 35K, trying to keep pushing yourself at a pace that's uncomfortable, you know, uh, struggle through uh, the, the desire to stop, you're going to be mentally fatigued. So if you can improve your resistance to mental fatigue, you should be able to perform better physically. And if you, and the idea is maybe that maybe it's just the same as training your muscles. You go out and fatigue yourself on a regular basis. So I, I tried uh, leading up to a marathon a number of years ago. I tried this brain endurance training where you sit in front of the computer, you know, for up, you know, an hour or more a day, doing these mentally fatiguing tasks. And then you go do your training. And, uh, you know, the, the verdict was like, I didn't, it wasn't a study for me, but there have been studies suggesting that this approach really works, um, at least in untrained subjects. For me, it was just unbelievably boring <laughs> and like just painful, painfully boring and also very time consuming. Like yeah. I, I find it hard to find time to train for a marathon, let alone to add another hour a day of sitting in front of your computer. No, sorry, honey, I can't, I can't uh, help <laughs> make dinner or do the dishes. I have to sit and press the left arrow if it's a triangle and the right arrow if it's a circle for the next 90 minutes. That yeah. really doesn't fly. So now there are some advances on that. I did this back in 2013, which is now seems like a long time ago. There's, there's, there's an app called uh, Soma NPT that one of the researchers developed that you, maybe you do it in an interval session. So you do hard physical training and then during your two minute break between intervals, instead of just standing around, you do physical training. Yeah. I, I mean, brain training so that you're enhancing the cognitive demands of a workout. Maybe that'll work. I mean, there's some evidence that it, it can work. Maybe it'll prove to be practical. I mean, in a more direct sense, just, again, to go to the sort of oblique takeaway is like, we all know about physical taper, right? Like if you're, if you're going to do a race, you don't train your hardest in the three days before the race, you back off so that your, your, your body can assimilate the training and you, and you can, uh, be well rested. Well, I think that's something to bear in mind mentally too. I think that's the, the sort of the easiest takeaway is that if you've got a race on Sunday, then, Hey, it's great. You're, you're not training as much for the days leading up to that. That doesn't mean you should take that extra time and do your taxes and, and, uh, you know, catch up on paperwork and do all your home improvement projects. Maybe if it's an important race and you really care about it, you should chill out, 
read a book, you know, relax and, and, and take your mental freshness as seriously as you would take your physical freshness because they both affect that central dial of, of effort. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good point. I like that. Um, now you also talked earlier about, you know, uh, how one of the things they were working on was, um, you know, putting a headset on to zap the, zap the brain. And I, I know you tried that yourself. How did you find that? Well, <laughs> I've tried it a few times now. I actually have a, a more updated take. So there's a company in, in California called Halo Neuroscience that makes headphones for transcranial direct current stimulation. That Basically, the idea is you apply a little electric current and it's supposed to make things feel easier. I had incredible trouble with that because uh, I, I had trouble making contact with my, with my scalp. I have uh, uh, a scalp with no hair that is designed to withstand the tough Canadian winters. And uh, I just, I, I, I had to sort of jam these little spikes into my scalp trying to make electrical contact. And so by the, t- anytime I finished a session of electrical stimulation, I was just feeling uncomfortable and angry. And so I was not experiencing any enhanced performance and the, and the evidence, the evidence such as it is, such as it exists is mixed at best. And that's even for in the laboratory, when you've got a scientist placing electrodes right on a specific part of your brain, not when you're just slapping these headphones on and hoping that it's hitting the right part of the brain. Now, I did go last fall, I spent a week in Italy cycling through the Alps with a, a company called Neurofire, which was is a sort of spin-off of the, the medical clinic that works with the Bahrain Merida uh, UCI cycling team that cycles in the Tour de France and all the Grand Tours. And they've been using electric brain stimulation. They have their own protocol that focuses on slightly different areas of the brain. And again, so I, I tried it out just because I, I mean, I'm fascinated by this idea that you can alter your physical limits just by running a little nine volt battery of, of charge through your brain. So I, and also I, you know, I wanted to go cycle in the Alps. So, um, <laughs> Who wouldn't? you know, I, I, I had a fantastic week and I had electric brain stimulation before some of the rides, which was supposed to enhance performance and after some of the rides, which was supposed to enhance recovery. Uh, okay. I have no idea whether it actually worked. Like it's, it's impossible to judge. Um, I could, and, and realistically the effects are only really supposed to last for an hour or so. So if you're doing a six hour ride, then it's not clear what benefit you get. But the fact is Burren Merida and other teams uh, in, you know, in the Tour de France are using this sort of technology and they're usually reasonably discriminating about the technology they use. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not totally crazy whether it re- works reliably. In a lot of cases, what you see is fancy new ideas will cycle through the Peloton for a couple of years. And then and, and the, the, the riders who have that new technology will have the sense that they have an advantage over everybody else. And that in itself is something very powerful. And then after a couple of years, everyone has the technology and mm-hmm. people more or less conclude that actually it doesn't really do anything anyway. So it sort of f- fades away until you know, it becomes a fad again in, in, in 10 years. So I, I honestly don't know what the trajectory of brain stimulation is. I do think there's some real science there, but whether it's, whether it's sufficiently robust that you can take it out into the real world and have people get benefits without having to go to a lab uh, every time they want to uh, have their, their brain stimulated I, remains to be seen. But to me, again, it's like, I, I almost feel bad writing about it sometimes because it's like, it's not ready for prime time. I, I am not advocating that people should go and electrically stimulate their brains. But I can't think of a more powerful demonstration of the concept that your limits are affected not just by your muscles, but by what's going on in your head. Then if you can just change them but by, by in 20 minutes by pressing a button, that to me is, is a, uh, something that's worth knowing if it's true because it's a reminder that you have to pay attention to what's going on in your brain, that it, that it matters. And so that would um, also bring into, into mind the placebo effect then, wouldn't it? Because that's also a belief in something working. That's kind of, you know, after meandering in a lot of different directions, that's kind of where I ended up with, the, with in, in my book and, and, and in my thinking more generally, is that we're, we can talk about all these different interventions that were, you know, like electric brain stimulation or brain endurance training, and there's other ones. Um, ultimately, what we're dealing with in some ways, I think, is belief. That fundamentally, it's it's self-belief that matters and there may be ways of kind of taking a shortcut you know taking having brain stimulation doesn't necessarily change your belief although it does if you if you believe you've got an advantage that helps but fundamentally it's 
at that moment where you're, you're being pushed to your limits, uh, do you believe that you're capable of pushing a little harder or of sustaining this for a little longer? And if you do, you will, um, yeah. because it's ultimately, again, the limits aren't, uh, set by, you know, your, your leg can't move anymore. Now there are, there are physical limits. Uh, you know, nobody can, can run a one hour marathon or, or high jump five meters or whatever, but in practice, we don't hit actually hit those physical limits. It's a question of how close we, we come to whatever physical limits there are. And so I think that's why I think that's why I end up thinking that self-talk and those sorts of sports psychology interventions are the most practical and powerful intervention to think of because they deal directly with what matters with, do you believe that you can continue as opposed to trying to change some variable like the, you know, the excitation of the neurons in a region of your brain that you hope will eventually translate into the sense that you can continue. So I, I, it's almost like once you, all these other things are kind of crutches to get you to the set, that same point. But if you can just learn to get yourself, or if you're someone like, let's say, Eliud Kipchoge, who has uh, a very unique mental approach to running, and he, you know, or maybe it's not very unique, but it's it's very you know very strong emphasis on self belief on what matters is if you believe you can do it, uh, and so I I don't think Eliud Kipchoge uh, had to uh, you know be taught to have self belief, but I think he intuitively I think he he has worked on that consciously. He he reads a lot of sort of self-help books of the type that personally I find kind of cheesy, but they, they, they help, they support him in his path towards believing that he can do what it takes. And I think that's the, the fundamental challenge is to get that belief, whatever path, and there may be different paths that work for different people. Maybe some people need the, not a sugar, a literal sugar pill, but some sort of, uh, crutch or device. And maybe I'm one of them that, that I need something like, uh, electric brain stimulation or brain endurance training to convince myself that I'm moving in the right direction. But may, that's maybe not the core of it. Yeah. Yep. Now also in the book, you spoke about um, the breaking two project um, and that was before they achieved it. And um, so do you think having achieved it now that that will change things? That's interesting. I, to me, the biggest change at least from from my perspective, was actually the first breaking two race where okay. the world record was two o two fifty seven, mm. and Elliot Kipchoge ran two hours zero minutes and twenty five seconds. So he ran more than two and a half minutes faster than mm. the standing world record. This was back in May twenty seventeen. Now after that, my belief then was like, okay, I know that there was some some trickery in the breaking two race. There was pacers that were coming in, and and the course was hyper optimized and stuff. So he had some advantages, but I still think it's going to change everyone's approach to the marathon. It's going to change what he believes is possible. And he's going to go out and run 201 something. And of course that was, it's a spring 2017. He went to Berlin that fall and it was rainy. He went to London the next spring and it was super hot. He went to Berlin the following fall. So in fall of 2018 and he ran 201, 40, 41, 43. I'm, I'm blanking on the time, but he, yeah. he ran that 201, which was a big breakthrough. But not as surprising because he had run two flat 25. And then in fall of 2019, there was the Ineos thing in, in Vienna and he ran 159. And I, it, it was amazing. It was surprising. I wasn't as surprised as I was when he ran two flat 25 in, okay. in, uh, in Monza in 2017. To me, that even when you know, it's kind of like, I don't know if it's willing suspension of disbelief. It's like when you see a... a, a I haven't seen puppet shows in a long time, but let's say you see a, a great puppet show or a marionette show and you can see the strings, but you can still let yourself be transported and see the, the, the marionettes as actual characters, even, even though the strings are visible. And so to me, it was something like that where, you know, there was some artifice in getting him to run two flat 25, but there was still a human who just ran two flat 25 on yeah. his own legs. And so therefore it must be possible to run faster than we thought before. And so I, th I think there has been a change. Now I should also say, I mean, there are some more obvious changes too. people. Are, the, the shoes now are faster with carbon fiber plates and, and cushioning. So part of the reason people are at, like lots of people are running faster is not that they've had a radical, uh, you know, awakening of their belief. It's that they're wearing shoes that are more efficient. Um, and so that, you know, that's, that's reality. But 
I do think there is also a, a change in uh, a, a general change among across runners of, of all levels that oh they're, they're, we're capable of a, a little more than we realized and and I think that is having an effect on how people approach the marathon. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. So do you have any sort of final takeaways for the listeners in how they can improve their performance? I mean, it would be dishonest of me to say anything other than, you know, keep training and do it for the long haul. Like yeah. really, the, the, you know, you have to build a big cake before the icing matters. And so... I, I mean, the sort of one of the things that I I really believe strongly is that uh, most people kind of overestimate what they can achieve in the short term. They get ambitious and think, yeah, you know, I want to run this 5K in, in six months and I want to do it this fast or whatever. And they underestimate what they can achieve in the long term. So, I mean, I think my, my I, I sometimes get questions, for, for, you know, from people who are like, what will it, so I've run this, I've run 310. I want to run 259 for a marathon. How do I do that? What kind, what do I need to do to make that improvement? And it's kind of like, in a sense, you can't start from the goal. You have to start from where you are and just yeah. work on getting faster and commit. Don't, don't, don't make it all or nothing about this spring. Commit to getting a little faster every season. And if you do that, after a few years, I mean, it's, it's like compound interest, right? You, you know, if you get a few percent faster season after season, you, all of a sudden you're, you're in a place where you, you didn't believe you could get. So um, the, I guess the, the, the one other thing I would say is, is uh, you know, find reasons to enjoy the process that, um, you know, I'm, how old am I? I'm 44 now. And so I have a lot of friends who I, who I went through my teens and twenties with who, for whom, and for all of us, running was life. There was nothing more important than running. And some of them don't run at all anymore. Some of them run a little bit. And some of them, some of us running is still a big part of our lives because it's become something more than just, can I run two seconds faster? It's, it's more about, it's, it's less about the specific time than about what's it going to feel like to push my limits today and how hard am I going to push myself? And that stays fun for as long as you're willing to, to, to let it stay fun. And in that, and if you, if you have that approach, you don't really care about electric brain stimulation because you don't care whether you're two seconds faster or 10 seconds faster without having done the work to get there. But if you get there by, by training harder or by, by pushing harder, by doing, by using motivational self-talk, then it's satisfying no matter what the actual time is. So, so I think learning to enjoy that process of just trying to be a little better or, or dig a little deeper, I think is, is really a, a good, good approach for the long term. Yep. That, yeah, that's fair enough. Focusing on the, the process rather than the outcome. I agree. All righty. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time today. Thanks, Isabel. I really enjoyed the conversation. All right. Thanks for that. Bye.